Hey everyone, Pastor Daniel here uh, to do our weekly discipleship hour. Sorry, it came a little bit later this week. Uh, but we're looking at a really exciting part of the Westminster Confession of Faith. Looking at, what does it mean that God is a trinity? That he is triune, that he is one God in three persons. So I'm excited to talk about that just for a few minutes today. Let's pray and ask the triune God's help uh, with us today. Let's pray. Uh, Father, Son, and Spirit, uh, we thank you that... Uh, Though you are mysterious, you reveal yourself, and we can know you. We can commune with you. Uh, we can be in relationship with you and be a part of you and your divine community. So, Lord, uh, have us uh, help us really to learn about these things. Send your Spirit to be our helper, uh, to give us knowledge about uh, who you are and how we can find communion and relationship with who you are. We pray all these things in the name of the Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, looking at just one section of the Westminster Confession of Faith, and it's a pretty uh, short section, but a lot's packed into it. So, chapter 2, section 3 of the Westminster Confession of Faith. In the unity of the Godhead, there be three persons, of one substance and power and eternity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. The Father is of none, neither begotten nor proceeding. The Son is eternally begotten of the Father, and the Holy Spirit eternally proceeding from the Father and the Son. And that's it. That's all we get on the Trinity. Uh, there's much more to be said, obviously, but uh, one thing I love about this confessional document is that it does try to not be wordy. Some parts of it can be a little wordy, but overall I feel like it does a good job of being of brevity, like helpful brevity um, and simplicity so that we can actually uh, benefit from it and use it in our discipleship with Jesus. So the Trinity uh, may be one of the most mysterious and strange and unique doctrines of Christianity, but it's perhaps one of the most essential doctrines of Christianity. Um, lots of things set apart Christianity from any other world religion, uh, but certainly the Trinity is really one of those chief doctrines that sets Christianity apart from any other religion or philosophy or worldview. Uh, just no other, no other worldview or religion out there has come up with something like the Trinity. Uh, it, it's it's mysterious, but it, and it's also put in simple terms for us to, at least for 2,000 years, Christians have been able to at least grasp um, this teaching about the Trinity, and it's involved in our worship. It's involved in our daily living and discipleship. The Trinity does matter for us, and um, that's a really important point. Before we dip, dive into what is a Trinity, just realize that the Trinity is important. And it's there because uh, it's there to help us worship God. It's, here, it's there to help us follow God. Um, we won't be able to worship God rightly or follow God rightly if we don't know the Trinity rightly. And so uh, being orthodox or having right and correct beliefs about the Trinity is really important. It's so important, in fact, that the Holy Spirit was uh, helping the church in the first couple of hundred years of church history um, grasp this from the scriptures, wrestle with it, and come to a firm conclusion on it. Uh, when I've read the Church Fathers, I see the Trinity all over the place. It's not like the Trinity took 300 years for someone to come up with. No, the Trinity has always been there. It's in the scriptures. It's in the early Church Fathers. But uh, there was false teaching that's popped up. There are people who misunderstood the Trinity. And so language and concepts had to be refined and terms defined. Um, so that we can have a firm grasp and really discern uh, truth from error when it comes to the Trinity. Because there's a lot of Trinitarian errors out there, uh, what we call Trinitarian heresies out there. And we'll talk about really any of those today. Uh, we'll just kind of give a positive presentation of what is the Trinity. So it starts off, a section of the confession starts off with the unity of the Godhead. There are three persons. And so there's unity. There's oneness and there's threeness. How do we understand that? Is it one plus one plus one is three, or is it like one times one times one? That's one, not three. Um, so how do we how do we understand the Trinity? Well, uh, the Confession says that there's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, and they are of one substance, power, and eternity. 
that term substance goes all the way back to those Trinitarian debates in the early church around the time of the Nicene Creed, uh, which is in the year 325 AD, so about 300 years after the time of Christ. And the term that was used in the Nicene Creed, which we may have recited in church at some point in your life, was that God is of, there's, it, there, they are one substance. Jesus and the Father are of the same or one substance. And the, and the term there was homoousios, the same or one substance, which is different from another term that was being used by the Arians, um, who believe that Jesus was a created being by the Father, um, and so he was not eternal. The Arians said that, no, Jesus is of, is of homoi ousios with the Father, or a similar or a like substance. So very important that we affirm that it's the same or one substance or the same essence of deity um, that the Father, Son, and Spirit all share. So they are one in their being one in their substance and essence um, as God. So um, we would say that the Father is God, the, the Son is God, the Spirit are God. But yet we affirm that, uh, we also we would affirm that they're all God in the same way. They are fully or truly God. Not, no person is more God than the other. Uh, no one has more deity than the other. They are all one um, in their deity and their substance. But we also affirm that the Father is not the Son, the Father is not the Spirit, the Spirit is not the Son, and, all, and the Son is not the Father, and all those, th all those things, um, they are distinct as persons. So unify, they're one as God, they're distinct as persons. And the way that the early church and the scriptures and this confession talk about their distinction is this, that the Father is of none. Well, what does that mean? Well, we'll get to that in a second. He is neither begotten nor proceeding what does that mean well it says the son is eternally begotten of the father and the holy spirit eternally proceeds from the father and son this may be very confusing um it still kind of confuses me but here's the essence of what's going on uh when we think of fathers and sons we think of begetting or the father uh from the father comes a son right um it's a one-time act. It's a one-time really ma making and creating uh, from parents to children. But there's some differences between when you think of the father begetting the son versus fathers and mothers begetting sons and daughters here on earth. Um, there's no mother here involved, and it is not a one-time begot begetting. It is any Jesus is eternally begotten. And so what this, what the early church, and really what the scripture means when it says that Jesus is the only, is the only begotten Son of God, is that uh, Jesus is always the Son, and the Father is always the Father. No, there never was a time when the Father was not the Father, but he becomes the Father because he begets the Son. No, the Father and the Son have always existed and have always been in relationship to one another. And just like sons sort of um, are begotten and they take on the father's dna and essence this is a way of communicating how the son takes on the essence of the father he is of the same substance the same homo usios but it's been doing this for eternity um, so the son has always been the son has always been in relationship with the father and they've always been of the same substance this they are they are both equally god and then the Holy Spirit proceeding from the Father and the Son. You may be wondering, where do you get that uh, whole thing about the Spirit proceeding? Uh, well, in John 15, verse 26, Jesus says that when the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. So Jesus says the Spirit proceeds from the Father, and he also proceeds from the Son because Jesus sends the Spirit as well, right? Um, so the fact that just as Jesus is eternally begotten of the Father, this eternal relationship, the Spirit has this eternal relationship with the Father and the Son. So all of the same substance, all in eternal relationship and communion and community with one another, um, all loving one another. And that's a huge point from all this. The confession doesn't say this, but it's really implied that the triune God is a community and communion of love. 
uh, some church fathers spoke of the Father as sort of the fountain of love, the fountain of, of the being of the Godhead. And um, that fountain of love overflows from the Father, and the Son and the Spirit, they overflow their love back towards the others. And so for eternity, isn't this beautiful? For eternity, the Father, Son, and Spirit have this communion of love, uninterrupted, uh, just pure, overflowing love. That's the essence of their communion together. Uh, as one Godhead. And here's the beautiful good news and gospel from this. The act of creation is this triune God turning outward, saying, let's make someone in our image, and let's involve them in our communion of love. Uh, Jonathan Edwards famously said that heaven is a world of love because it's filled with this God of love who's always been a communion in, uh, of love. And we're involved in that community and communion of love. Which is why in 1 John, you know, John says, you can't hate your brother and say you love God. You can't hate and then say you love, because God is a God of love. If God's a God of love and you've been saved by this God, you should love one another. And so uh, love really is, you can, there's no, I, would, I don't like to argue, as I argue already uh, in our series that there's one chief attribute of God but if you could name one it probably is love that God's a God of love a communion and fountain of love and so um, John 15 gave us this one text where you distinguish the Father, Son, and Spirit another great text to distinguish the Father, Son, and Spirit and you may know this is Jesus' baptism right there were some uh, early heretics in the early church that thought that uh Maybe it's just one person who puts on different masks of the Godhead. So this one God puts on the mask of the Father in the Old Testament, the mask of the Son in the New Testament, and now he's the Holy Spirit to us. But here at Jesus' baptism, uh, Matthew 3, verse 16, um, Jesus was baptized, went up in the water, the heavens were open, and Jesus, he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove coming to rest upon him. And then a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. So if this uh, oneness view of God, um, what's called um, uh, Sabellianism, um, here's what needs to happen. The, the son is being baptized. He throws up a hologram to show the spirit. And then he does this ventriloquist. That's where he throws his voice up in the heaven, which comes back down saying, you're my son with whom I'm well pleased. So it's a great David Copperfield or David Blaine uh, magic trick. Um, but no, that'd be a ridiculous way to think about how our God operates. So some beautiful texts to show three persons um, of God. But yet, if we look at John chapter 1, we know that the Old Testament, the Old Testament talks about the oneness of God. Uh, the Shema of Israel. Hear Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. You know, the oneness of God is clear in the Old Testament, especially in the Shema of Israel, Deuteronomy 6.4. But John chapter 1 affirms even the oneness of God, even with the persons of the Godhead. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. Is Jesus with God or is he God? Well, there's the oneness of God, right? He was in the beginning with God, all, made, all things were made through him, and without him not anything made that was made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And the Word, so verse 14, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory glory is the only son of the father full of grace and truth so jesus is of god from the father he's also is god so oneness and threeness all together and here's the thing there's no um one verse in the in the bible that says here is the whole doctrine of the trinity it's just not how the biblical doctrine works the trinity is always assumed in the new testament so uh uh, a famous benediction in the, in the New Testament uh, from the Apostle Paul, 2 Corinthians 13, verse 14. He says to end this letter, The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, which is the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. So Paul just, the Trinity just kind of runs off his lips. And this is all over the, all over the epistles especially, where you see the Trinity everywhere. Um, it's just assumed. Like this is part of life and fellowship and worship and doctrine of the church. Um, there's no systematic theology textbook in the New Testament to explain the Trinity for us. It's just there. Um, it was believed from the get-go. Um, and so I think there's a lot of importance with the Trinity. Um, we should learn about it. We should love it. We should read books about it. We should hear sermons on it. But I 
think the best way for us to grasp the Trinity and to fall in love with the triune God in this community of love, I think the way that we actually come to understand the Trinity, let me get some fuzz off my shoulder here, uh, to understand the Trinity is through worship. Um, historic Christian worship involves the Trinity in our worship. Um, sometimes our church sings a doxology in church, and so the very end of that will say, Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Some churches sing the Gloria Patri. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. And so, uh, and then there's beautiful hymns like Holy, 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 uh, which says, God in three persons, blessed Trinity. Uh, there's other hymns and songs like that, and prayers, um, uh, good liturgical prayers which pray to the triune God. Sometimes when I do an extemporaneous prayer, I'll pray to the Father, Son, and Spirit. And so uh, I think worship is one of the best places, a worship service with the church where we can sing to the triune God and pray to the triune God and confess together the triune God. I think that's how God uh, helps us learn the Trinity and ingrain the Trinity upon our heads and our hearts um, so that we can be discipled in this doctrine. It's a mysterious doctrine, and so maybe it's just God's goodness that the best way to be discipled in this doctrine is through worship. Um, I think it makes a lot of sense to me. So that's all I want to share about the Trinity today. Um, I hope this was helpful, and I'm sure there's lots of other questions you can have about the Trinity. And um, if you do have those questions, come worship with us here in Central New York. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll point you uh, to the love of the Father, through the work of the Son, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Love you all. Thank you for tuning in and listening. Grace and peace. God bless.